Hi everyone and welcome to this fab lesson from AXA Arctic Live where we're going to be looking at Arctic food webs. It's really wonderful to have you all with us. Um, we've got schools joining from the UK, from Canada, Bermuda, Ukraine, India and New Zealand. So fantastic uh, array of countries joining and really excited to talk to you about all those crazy creatures that you might find in the Arctic and how they are all joined together in food webs. Really, really important to understand. But before we get started, I'm just gonna go through a few basics. Uh, we have uh, a few things to go through. So first of all, how to interact uh, during the live lesson, and that's using the Q&A and poll app um, just to the side of the screen. If you do have this full screen at the moment and you want to keep it full screen, you can always log on to the live lesson on a secondary device such as a smartphone and then get onto the Q&A there. Uh, so all the Q&A, all the questions are moderated and you can upvote, so please do um, post as many as possible. We do have uh, a section at the end where we'll go through the more exploratory questions. Uh, but if you don't understand something or you want me to go over something, then please do pop in a question for clarification. So to check up on subject knowledge, do that at any time. And I'll rewind a bit, go, go a bit slower, whatever helps you guys understand um, all about food webs in the Arctic. If for any reason you need uh, support or something's not quite working, at the bottom right hand corner of every web page on the Encounter EDU website, you will find a little speech bubble. Just click on that and we will try and help you um, with any issues you may be encountering. But uh, just coming on to this live lesson, we are going up to the Arctic. Uh, I've been there now up in the Arctic, I think seven times. Um, normally we're based um, on the island of Svalbard. Now Svalbard is halfway between the north of Norway and the North Pole. And we go up, that, go up there each year to investigate how the Arctic is changing and how that is affecting uh, the life um, in the frozen north. Now, when we're, we stay in the Arctic, it is quite a stunning setting. It is in a small research community called Nyolesund, and that used to be a mining settlement, um, but has changed into this international science settlement or village. So that means that scientists from all over the world can fly up first to the main town uh, on Svalbard called Longyearbyen, and then a short 20 minute hop on a very small plane over the mountains uh, to the science village. And there the about uh, 10 or 12 countries have research stations. And those are buildings where scientists, visiting scientists can, can live and uh, do their work. There's also several laboratories for specialist equipment dotted around. And there's a joint canteen where everybody can go for their meals during the day. And then plenty of support in terms of boats to get you out to sample the sea, skidoos to travel around um, up onto the glaciers if you're studying the glaciers. And it's just a, an amazing place to do science and within about two days travel of London. So we can be from where we are based in the UK, get up to the Arctic in just a couple of days. Really, really fantastic facility. When we're up there, we're doing a range of different science projects. At the moment, we're looking at how plastic and changes in ocean is by understanding how living things are connected. And that's what we're looking at today, 
how is life in the Arctic connected? And by understanding that, we can understand how we can conserve the whole ecosystem, all the life, and not just single species. So what we're going to do in this lesson is we're going to do sort of three or four things. First of all, we're going to look at some of the science vocab needed to describe feeding relationships. We're then going to learn a bit about some of the living things you might encounter if you came up to Neolisand or to other parts of the Arctic. And last, we're then going to try and put those different animals and plants into a food web to work out what are the feeding relationships that connect all these different living things. After that, there's then a section for question and answer where it's great already to see a couple of questions come into the live chat app. So without further ado, let's get started with a little bit of background knowledge on the vocab to describe feeding relationships and food webs. Now, for some of you, if you're joining this and you're a bit younger, um, this may be the first time you'll have heard some of these words. If you're a bit older, then it's some good revision and also to learn about these words in a new context. You might have learned them using your local wildlife um, already. The first set of words we're going to look at are all the vores. So vor is this means really basically eating in Latin. There's quite a lot of Latin words in science, which can make it feel a bit frightening to start off with. But we've got these three words, carnivore, herbivore, and omnivore. And if we just break those down into their meanings, we can find that actually they're really simple words to use. The first one, carnivore, um, just means meat eater. So uh, in the Arctic, we might have meat eaters such as the polar bear, uh, such as the beluga whale in the Antarctic. You would have the leopard seal. Uh, in um, India, you might have the tiger. Uh, in North America, you could have the uh, mountain lion or a wolf. Uh, so there's plenty of examples of carnivore out there, and it just means meat eater. The second word we're going to look at is herbivore. And herbie, Latin for plant, um, that's where our word herbs come from. Uh, and it's just basically herbivore is a plant eater. So that's um, anything from a rabbit to a sheep to a cow to an ox to a bison to a uh, copepod in the world's oceans um, to uh, lots of people across the planet are herbivores just eating plants. You could almost call it vegetarian. Um, and so that's another way of looking at it. And then last, but by no means least, we have omnivore. So a lot of people are also omnivores, so eating a mixture of plant and, and um, meat. And also we find omnivores up in the Arctic too. Um, so a range of Arctic animals, um, if they can't find um, meat to eat, like the polar bear or the Arctic wolf or the Arctic fox, will turn to, to berries. Um, in some cases, polar bears are known to eat a type of seaweed called kelp. Um, so there are examples of omnivores all across the planet. The next sort of area we're going to look at from the types of food that living things eat is this, this predator-prey relationship. And this starts getting us into a sort of connection between two different animals. So predators are the names that we give to animals that eat other animals and specifically it's a predator of something so we have a polar bear the predator of the seal the seal is a prey 
Um, here in the UK, it may be the predator is a fox and the prey is the chicken. Um, in somewhere um, like South Africa, it may be that the predator is a lion and the prey is an antelope. So predator is the animal that eats and prey is the animal that gets eaten. And we just use some of these words to help us move around the food web to understand how animals are connected in these feeding relationships. Now, science has a sort of another way of describing where uh, living things get their energy from. And they've got these two words. The first word is producer, and the second word is consumer. And they're very, very sort of like common sense words when you realize what they're referring to. A producer is a living thing that produces energy using the sun. So if we think about living things that use the sun to produce energy, we have uh, plants, uh, we have all grass, we have trees, we have the algae in the ocean, both microscopic algae, microalgae, micro meaning small, and macroalgae, macro meaning big, and that's a seaweed that we would be able to see when we go down to the beach or to the shore. So consumers, sorry, producers, those living things producing energy from sunlight, using the sunlight to grow. You may have covered the process of photosynthesis in class, and that's what we're referring to here. The second term, consumer, is when a living thing consumes something else to get its energy. So it's consuming a plant, it's consuming uh, a, another animal. And so that's the difference between a producer and a consumer, is one produces its energy, own energy almost, using the sun, and the other is consuming plants and animals to get its energy. So I hope that's clear. Do pop into the Q&A if you want me to go through any of those terms again. So we're going to move now on to a description of the different living things that you might encounter if you came up to the Arctic with us. And we're going to do the activity soon, the food web activity. So hopefully you've got your um, student sheets, your activity sheets. I'm going to actually use black and white sort of drawings because they're a bit easier to see and as I hold them up uh, on screen, but you should have the whole colored, um, the whole colored um, photographs. And also um, you should have a sort of layout where we're going to put them. So if you don't have those, depending on what you're working on your own or in groups, make sure you have those materials that you can be cutting them out as you're listening to a description uh, of the different living things. So the first thing we're going to uh, have a look at, just in alphabetical order, is algae. As I mentioned before, these are the tiny plant-like living things that are found in the ocean. And they get their energy from the sun. Uh, so they're photosynthesizing and they're using that sun energy uh, to grow. And then they'll get eaten in turn by other small creatures. The next creature we're going to have is the Arctic cod. Uh, so it is a, a fish that lives in these cold waters. It's not the Atlantic cod, that's the cod that ends up in fish and chips, famous British fish and chips. Um, and it's got a very cool adaptation. So it has antifreeze um, in its body to stop it from, from freezing in these terribly cold waters up here. <laughs> then we have the Arctic fox, uh, a great uh, friend of Arctic life. There are a few Arctic fox 
um, that live in and around the science station. And they're incredibly cute um, and wonderful. Uh, they have been known to pee on, on some of the science experiments left out and about and can also be found near the kitchen door hoping for a scrap or two. So it's wonderful to have the Arctic fox around. The next um, living thing I'm going to talk about is the beluga whale. <clears throat> now, we've been absolutely blessed on previous expeditions to have a huge pod of beluga whale swimming around um, the research vessel, the little boats that we've been on. Um, they're amazing. They're, they're related to, of course, whales, but um, more so sort of toothed whales. They have teeth um, and, and hunt animals rather than sort of sieving through the water like some of the larger whales, like the blue whale. Um, so really wonderful to have those. Uh, we have um, the clam. So a type of shellfish, the clam, uh, found on the bottom of the sea. And um, it's, it's like a lot of shellfish, like sort of um, oysters and mussels and other shellfish. It filters through the water and then takes food, tiny particles coming through. So it's just a filter feeder sieving through the water for small bits of food. Then we have the copepod. Um, so I don't know if we've got that written down, but the copepod, C-O-P-E-P-O-D, uh, the most abundant animal, uh, I think almost on the planet, if not only just, at, just in the ocean. Um, a stunning number of, of copepods in the ocean, 1,347 billion, billion of them. Um, so that's 1347 and then 18 zeros, um, quite a standing number of copepods. They're tiny wee, uh, so if they're sort of the size of a sort of pinky fingernail all the way down to a sort of exclam exclamation mark or, or sometimes even as small as a full stop or comma. Um, and they're a crustacean, they're related to, uh, to sort of lobsters and, and uh, crabs and shrimp in, in that family, um, but play a really, really important role, which we'll come on to in a bit. We have the polar bear, the iconic polar bear, um, in Latin, Ursus maritimus. Um, they're, they're not plain white, uh, they're a sort of light cream color, they're a sort of fantastic animal. Um, sea bear is the, the from the Latin Ursus maritimus, and I uh, spend a lot of time in and around water, um, hunting on the sea ice, hunting seals on the sea ice, uh, swimming. Great swimmers as well. Great at going across um, thin ice. Really, really well adapted um, to the Arctic. Our largest land carnivore. Absolutely fantastic animal. Uh, next up, we have the ringed seal. Um, so seals, um, really just fantastic. We see them quite often. Um, their heads bob bobbing above the water, sometimes in and amongst ice. Um, sometimes when we've been camping on ice um, and we've been putting holes through the ice, they've, they've come up through those holes to say hello. Um, so fantastic um, and really wonderful creatures. Um, and, and when they're young, um, pretty sweet as well. Uh, and last, but by no means least, we have the walrus. And the walrus, um, there's, if we were up in Nalesund, there's a sort of down this, this bit of coast here, down that way, there is a walrus colony. Big tusks uh, for the adult males. Whiskers, um, as they dive down, they use the whiskers to feel around uh, the bottom of the sea for their food. And that's just, a, that's just a brief description of some of the living things that you can find in the Arctic. And what we're going to do now is, is a quick poll um, just to find out which is your favourite animal of those. We're going to give you sort of 60 seconds, and that gives you a little bit of time also to, to arrange um, the activity materials you need, because that's what we're going to do when we come back.
Yeah. Really interesting um, to see the polar bear going into an early lead there. I had to sort of break away from watching you guys voting um, just to come, come, come back. But it'll be interesting um, both to see sort of, you know, whether you change your minds and also to see if there's, oh, we've got ring seal in a close second. Well, having seen that um, video of, of the seal pup there, I'm not surprised that uh, ring seal is, is, is a close second um, to the polar bear. So that's fantastic. What we're going to do now is we're going to look at the food web activity, talk a little bit about the connections between the living things in the Arctic, and then we're going to come back afterwards and look at that pole again. But this time, trying to think about whether understanding the connections and the importance of different um, living things in the food world, whether you've changed your mind. So just have a think about that as we're going through the activity. Now, I know you've got wonderful little photographs cut out and a little diagram to stick them on. Um, I, on the other hand, have my very own bigger cardboard version, which we're going to use, and we're going to go through this together. What I'm going to do is as we go through this, I'm just going to give you sort of 30 seconds every so often just to give you time to have a think about where you're going to position the different living things on this food web. So it's exactly the same. Just all these sticky bits are where I'm going to place, place my living things colors. So we're going to go through this together, give you a bit of time to have a chance, think through it. So starting at the bottom, we're always going to have our um, producer. Um, sorry, over here, this is where we're going to have our producer with the arrows um, going from, so the arrows here, that's a really important thing to remember actually, the arrows are the direction of the energy, they're not, not the direction of being eaten. So the producer we put here gives energy to these two living things. So that's what we're going to be looking at first. So hopefully all of you put your hand on the, the producer now on the table and with me stick it in the right place. Okay, there's only one producer and that's the algae. So hopefully you've all been brilliant and you've got the algae in first position. What I want you to do now is the algae is giving its energy in two ways. So I'm going to give you 30 seconds and I want you to choose the two animals that you think eat the algae. Okay. And I'm just going to give you a quick clue. The one with legs goes here. Okay. 30 seconds. Have a go. So we're going to find out um, how amazing you all are. So I want to pick, pick, give me a big wave and hands up, big Arctic wave, if you've got the clam here. So the, remember the filter feeder, taking the algae out of the water, and then the gobbling little copepod here. So we've got the copepod, gobbling up the algae and the clam as the filter feeder. So a big round of applause uh, to everyone who got that so far. We're now going to move on to this square here. And this square, I would like you to think of the six remaining animals you have. Who is going to be the copepod eater? Who is going to be the copepod eater out of the six remaining animals you have? Okay, on your marks, get set, go.
So for everyone who got the Arctic Cod, amazing, well done. The Arctic Cod eating the copepods. Arctic Cod playing an incredibly important role. So first of all, we've got the algae going to something that's very abundant, so there's lots of them. And that's starting to be something that you can actually get a bit more sort of building box protein from. And then the Arctic Cod, even bigger, eating all those little copepods and then can be the food for much larger animals. So the Arctic Cod playing a very important role there, much like the copepod uh, too. So we're going to come on to this sort of like rather sort of branching sort of piece here with a large number of animals um, coming on this side. And then we also have the single animal up here, the, the clam eater. Actually, maybe let's do the clam eater first. So of your five remaining animals, let's see if you've got 30 seconds to come up with the clam eater coming up into this section here. So hopefully you've all worked out this from the clues given in advance. When we went through all the animals. It's the walrus using its whiskers along the bottom of the ocean, searching out through the dark and the sort of muddy gravelly bottom. It's going to be the clam eater. So there we have the walrus. So we've just got these four sections to look out for. And let's do this one next. The main, I think we're going to do the main um, eater of, there are going to be two eaters of the, of, of the Arctic cod. So we've got one here and one here. This one is bigger and whiter than this one. Okay, so two last one, two up there. And this one is bigger and whiter. 30 seconds, have a go. Brilliant. So everyone who got the beluga whale, the bigger and whiter fish eater, a toothed whale hunting for those Arctic cod, brilliant. And then the other one, of course, will be the seal. So here we have the energy going from the copepod. And we can see these animals getting bigger from the copepod to the Arctic cod to the seal and the beluga whale. We've got two predators up here consuming all these different animals and especially this top predator here may not get adult versions of all these animals but definitely able to eat some of the younger ones and so we've got a top predator here and another seal eater maybe um, baby seals to go into these two spots so this is the last 30 seconds to complete our food web have a go Brilliant. So, yes, the polar bear, the apex predator, the top of the food web, the top of the food chain, up at the top here, which leaves the last place to our friendly Arctic fox. 
And there we have a very simple Arctic food web. Of course, there are more living things um, in the Arctic and in different areas where you get different food webs and more complex relationships as well. But what we can see here is the producer at the bottom, the algae, providing energy for the copepod and the clam. That energy then going to larger animals all the way up to the top predators up at the top, uh, consuming these animals, these large animals here. We get the size going up. And really wonderful to see also how it's all connected and also to think what would happen if any of these single animals were affected by environmental change? Would it make more of a difference if there were no copepods? Would it make more of a difference if there were no polar bears? How might that affect the overall health of the Arctic environment? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to ask you to revisit the poll that you answered before this activity. And to think maybe not about the cutest animal, your favorite animal, that my favorite Arctic animal wasn't on the list, um, but to think about what is the most important animal in the Arctic. And so just have a time just to finish it up, have a look at your food web, and then over the next minute, 60 seconds, think about the most important animal in the Arctic and whether your mind's been changed by having a look at the food web and thinking about the connections that you can find in the Arctic environment. no more polar bears no more cute seal pups um pretty well i think everyone has gone for copepod these really numerous uh, and, um, animals at the bottom of the food web and in fact that's been the animal of focus for a lot of the research uh, that we've been doing up in the arctic for the past 10 years how is the copepod being affected by changes in the environment and next wednesday um, at the same times as today, we have a, an, an investigation and also we have one of the research scientists coming on to explain um, more about copepods and how they're being affected uh, by changes in the Arctic Ocean. So fantastic to see that appreciation of Arctic ecology already. So for the next 10 or so minutes, it's fantastic to see um, your questions coming through and hope to answer as many as possible. And the first one we have is from Crofland's Junior School, um, and that's how many polar bears live in the Arctic? Um, Crofland, that's a great question. It's actually quite a hard question uh, to answer. Uh, there are some areas where we know more um, about the number of polar bears than others. It's better, better studied. Um, and there's more uh, money going towards paying people to, to count these things. But you can imagine the Arctic's huge, and there's only about 20,000 estimated polar bears around. They're quite hard to count, um, but we, our best estimates are there are about 20,000 polar bears. Their populations have been doing really well um, after a, sort of a ban on hunting in, in large parts of the Arctic, um, I think in the 60s and 70s. And then now, but we're seeing an increased pressure 
um, from a loss of sea ice, the natural habitat being caused um, by warming? Great, great question. Um, we have Irby School in, in Cumbria, and we have Oliver and Evan. Um, great question here. We would like to know uh, how the houses don't sink into the snow. Well, here's a handy tip, Oliver and Evan. Don't build your house with the foundations on the snow. Um, what you do is you build them on permafrost. Uh, and permafrost just relates to permanently frozen ground. So you'll see that most buildings in the Arctic are on stilts, and these stilts driven into the permafrost, and that's how they stay steady. Now, one of the big problems is the permafrost is melting as the Arctic warms, and there are huge there's towns, there's uh, huge sort of settlements across the Arctic um, that are being affected uh, by the melting permafrost, changing uh, what was sort of flat, easy areas into hummocked and divoted um, sort of, you know, puddled, um, difficult areas. I think there's some great stuff in, out in, in, in Russia. I can't remember the exact, uh, not great for the people living there, but a great example of this, this happening. Um, uh, and we'll try and find that, that reference for you. Um, and second question from Sophia is why do pipes not freeze at night? Uh, sometimes they do, <laughs> um, but uh, insulation. So insulation, incredibly important science concept when you're dealing with the Arctic. So you'll see that um, different animals have different insulating techniques from fur to blubber. Uh, and there's also uh, for Arctic scientists, we use insulating techniques with the clothes we wear and the same relates um, for pipes, basically lagging for, for pipes to keep, to keep the water unfrozen, but really, really good questions from all of you guys. Uh, from Charles Dam Primary, have you ever had frostbite or been very cold? Um, I have had frostbite, um, but many, many moons ago, uh, my, my bit of my ear went missing. You can't really see that. You don't really want to see my sort of wonky ear um, missing from a bit of frostbite from a very long time ago. Um, and then frost nip, um, where you get sort of frozen skin on your cheeks and often on the end of your nose. And it feels a bit like sort of like half frozen chicken, a sort of slightly crystalline, crunchy, waxy um, feel. And if you've got frost nip, you can just sort of melt it, melt your skin. You have to have someone who's, who, who is, is very trusting and it's great teamwork where you see someone's maybe snot cold nose where your snot freezes and then there's got frost nip coming there and you have to take your gloves off and then melt melt the, the flesh and, and get all that going again. Um, and it's been very cold. How cold has it been? Um, minus 48 degrees Celsius was the coldest sort of ambient temperature we had. And then, which is, I think, minus 50 something Fahrenheit. And then with, um, let's see, with wind chill, I think in Neolosund, Neolosund up here, we've had minus 50, 55, minus 53 with wind chill. And um, in the Canadian Arctic, we had minus 60 something with wind chill. Um, so it's a really quite cold and really dangerous uh, for frostbite and frost nip as well. Um, wow, um, great. So. We've got year six Huntley Primary. These are great questions. Uh, have any of the animals interfered with your investigations or equipment? Um, well, we've had the peeing um, Arctic fox. Wasn't my experiment, um, but was another uh, member of the science community in Arlesen. Uh, and then um, we've had a seal come up and interfere. Um, we put holes in the ice to do experiments through the sea ice, so the seas below. And then the seals decided this is a great place to come up. We first sort of thought there might be a seal there because when we lifted the lid, so you put a lid on top of your ice hole overnight, so it doesn't, so to insulate it, so it doesn't freeze too much. Uh, and it's quite a whiffy, fishy smell. And we didn't quite know where that came from. And eventually we found out it was a sort of smelly uh, seal breath um, from eating too many fish. Um, so that was um, messing about slightly. I'm trying to think, we had a rogue lemming come through camp once. Um, which was which was um, very surprising. I don't know who was more surprised, the lemming or us. It's about sort of ten miles from from the nearest land, 
And, and then polar bears, of course, are something to be very careful of um, when you're working in the Arctic. Uh, and you get a lot of trading to use different bangers and things to, to ward them off. Uh, wow. What is, what is the longest food chain in the world? That's epic question. Um, that, uh, the biggest food web. So you're probably going to get bigger food webs when you get to the tropics. Um, and, and that's because you get more di normally more diversity um, of animals. So biodiversity just means the number of different, really different species um, in a given area. Um, and so when you get to the poles, you get fewer different species. So the food webs are going to be simpler um, by and large. And then places like the coral reef um, in, um, in the ocean and tropical rainforests are going to have that highest highest um, sort of complexity of food web. But the exact number, that's an awesome question, and I'm not quite sure. Um, I think by the time you get work through the different levels, I think six or seven is kind of going to be your, your sort of longest food chain in terms of the different levels. And a really technical, here you go, here's something to impress your science teacher, trophic levels, those levels of, of feeding. And then, you know, probably sort of maximum, probably about 10 in terms of, you know, algae to tiny shrimp to little fish, big fish, big fish, bigger fish, bigger fish, all the way up to, to a shark or, or a large ocean predator like that. Um, what will happen, as we've got uh, three more minutes, I'm going to whip through these. What will happen to the polar bears if global warming continues? Uh, their traditional feeding uh, will go. They, they like sea ice. They like hunting for seals. So they'll have to find another way to feed. Um, or probably more like things like around human habitation. Um, they may sort of start interbreeding with grizzly bears, um, eat more kelp, berries, um, looking at eggs from the lot of geese and ducks and migratory birds up here um, during the summer. So fledglings as well, so chicks and that kind of thing. So their diet will change, there'll be pressure on them. They'll have to use more energy to get less food. Um, how that actually works out in the long run in terms of the population, um, we don't know, but the pressure is there and we'll just, you know, it's not a good thing. Um, what type of fish do you catch in the Arctic? And that's from Barrett's. There have been a variety of different type of fish um, finding up here you know, Atlantic cod coming up here, mackerel coming up here. So the finding, there's a small fishing fleet off swell by the finding sort of more and more sort of temperate and tropical fish come up, not just Arctic species. Um, so next um, we have, so that's really interesting how we're seeing a warming ocean change, the types of animals found in the Arctic. SDG warriors, how is the circadian rhythm of polar animals different from those of animals living at the equator? <laughs> It's an area of current research. So people are trying to, scientists are trying to understand it. Essentially, the circadian rhythms of polar bears, and they're looking at other Arctic animals, tend to be more elastic. So circadian rhythm just basically means I'm sort of asleep for eight hours, normally over a 24 hour period. I'm asleep for eight hours, I wake up, I feel a bit tired, I then get moving, I then do my stuff, and then at night I feel sleepy and I go to bed again. It's the rhythm, natural rhythm of, of a body, of a living thing over a 24-hour period. What research is tending to show is that animals that live in the polar regions probably still have this daily cycle of being more asleep and more active, but it's a bit more elastic. Um, so that you, for polar bears, you have sort of, they will be a bit active, but if they're, if they're sort of hibernating, um, they will um, be less active, even though they're sort of more awake than they are in sort of certain parts um, of the um, daily rhythm. And then some animals, of course, like the Arctic reindeer, um, just switch off the body clock. It'd be quite nice, wouldn't it? Um, you know, I know probably lots of teachers watching will probably say, get to uh, the holidays, and I just quite like to switch off my body clock and, and sleep for six weeks. <laughs> be, be more Arctic reindeer. There we go. Um, we've just got time. We're over time, but we've got um, 
Um, two more questions. What is the name of the algae that lives on the underside of the ice? The, the, the lots, lots of different species, but you're right to highlight um, the, the algae that lives on the bottom of the sea ice or grows at the bottom of the sea ice. Um, and it, if we lose that sea ice and the algae, sugar is coming from the algae and the, and the dead bits of algae that go to the bottom of the sea, um, we start to lose that, then animals like sea stars and sea urchins um, will get hungrier um, because there'll be less food coming down. Great, great question. And last, but by no means least, uh, John Paul II, um, in Canada, how um, are the animals being affected by climate change? Um, you know, the animals have adapted over thousands and thousands of years to living in a very cold climate. And the way they eat, the way they travel, the way they reproduce, the way they keep warm is all suited to an environment. Now, it's really thinking about the speed of change and the speed of adaptation. And the speed of environmental change, in most cases, is happening faster than the speed of adaptation uh, for these animals. And so it's going to put a lot of pressure on them. If you, if you can't find the food that you need, if you can't operate in the way that you normally operate, it can lead to um, a decline in those populations uh, leading towards extinction. Um, so, and especially if you think about the Arctic, if you think about, oh, it's getting warmer, all the animals sort of around this area can go, oh, I can start moving north, I can start moving north because it's getting warmer. It's fine for me because I can move north. There's no further north <laughs> for the animals used to the Arctic. So that migration, that ability to move somewhere because the other places are getting too warm, stops and then you end up with competition with species coming up from the south and nowhere to go as well so a variety of different impacts so many great questions loved having you um, as part of this arctic food web uh, lesson as part of axa arctic live uh, and it's been fantastic and and do just you know consider the connection of life do take time to, um, to, to observe nature, whether that's in the school grounds, at home, garden, park, going for a long walk, and think about how all the different living things you see are connected, and that how we have to look after the whole ecosystem, the whole environment, to keep all these living things healthy and build a sustainable future. Thank you so much for watching, and look forward to having you as part of more lessons from AXA Arctic Live over this week and next. But for now, it's bye-bye. Bye-bye.